morning. I wasn't planning on making any jokes in my personal reflection, but I will say it wasn't two weeks after I turned in my final membership papers that I received the paper titled, Good News, You've Been Chosen to Share Next Body Life Sunday. So, just, yeah. I think every young person growing up in tech thinks about what they would talk about if they ever had to give a personal reflection. It's something that I have given a lot of thought to over the years, but I never felt like I had anything worth sharing. About two months ago, when I sat down to start writing, I still had no ideas that seemed appropriate or to fit that I wanted to share. I had a few vague thoughts, but nothing I felt passionate about sharing. I wrote up something that was fine, but Friday night I changed my mind, changed my topic, and rewrote it all yesterday. I know this is something that probably most people in here don't know, but I really struggled with anxiety over the last year and a half. The very first time, I had a panic attack. I had no idea what was going on and ended, and ended up going to the ER because I thought I was having an allergic reaction. For the next nine months, I had panic attacks multiple times a week and had no idea what was going on. I, was so, I had so much fear and because of that, I never even told anyone. In September, I was taking a psychology class in college and we were talking about different kinds of anxiety and I finally realized that's what I was struggling with. I didn't tell anyone for two more months after that, but then I found a trusted mentor. She started working me through my fear and anxiety from a biblical perspective. I was finally able to tell my parents and some other close friends. I seemed to be doing better, but in March, everything came crashing down harder than before. I started, seem I started having what seemed to be heart issues. I went to the doctor multiple times, had blood tests run, um, but no conclusions were come to. Through all this, my anxiety was higher than ever. Fear was controlling my life. By the end of April, I was at my lowest. I felt like I was having reactions every time I would eat. Food was something that was a big struggle with me. I was hardly eating at all. For a time, I was eating once a day, and I would feel awful afterwards. I woke up every day miserable. My anxiety was crippling, and I finally understood why people with severe mental health struggles took their own lives. I didn't want to keep on living. Getting out of bed each morning was a struggle. And I look back on April and all I see is a dark cloud hanging over it. I felt de desperate and hopeless. And, um, but as sure as we all know, facts don't care about your feelings. Even though I felt no joy in life, I knew that God was still faithful. I knew he cared about me and that I was not alone. I have never prayed more in my life than that time. Despite all the bad during that time, I have never experienced the type of spiritual intimacy with the Lord. My anxiety led me to a type of surrender that I have never before experienced. I was constantly reminded, reminding myself that God was the only fear that removed all other fears and that he was the only one I needed to fear. I surrounded myself with the word of God all over my, on my phone, on my dresser, on my bed, my desk, wherever I was. So I had those truths surrounding me. Whenever I was feeling anxious, I would repeat verses that reminded me of God's truths. Like Proverbs 19.23, which says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Whoever rests satisfied, he will not be visited by harm. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Jesus Christ. These verses and others like them were my daily companion through those days. I constantly was reminding myself that he is faithful and merciful. I started implementing practices into my everyday life, such as physically exhausting my body through exercise, cutting back on screen time, and eliminating certain things from my diet. Slowly but surely, I began to improve. I began to enjoy living again. I began to enjoy eating again. The Lord was so good. Today, I still struggle with some anxiety, but I have truly been able to find peace and joy in everyday life. There are still some days that are worse than others, but it's not the center point of my focus every day. I have truly found freedom from anxiety in a way I truly questioned was possible two months ago. My life is still far from perfect, and like I said, it's still something I have to combat. But the Lord has truly been my grounding point. 
and the peace I have felt through him has been indescribable. I'm spending this summer volunteering with Created Equal in Columbus, and in the end of April and the beginning of May, I was so overwhelmed by anxiety that I didn't even think it would be possible for me to go spend the, my summer in such an intense setting. But just as, running, as I was running out of hope that I would be able to do that, I began to dramatically improve, and I'm just so thankful that I was healthy enough to be able to serve in this capacity again this summer. I'm truly saddened for any person who experiences anything like this without the hope that God provides to see them through that hard time. I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but I hope that through what I experience, that someday I can be prepared to help someone else through it. I pray to God that none of my future children will ever have to go through what I experienced, but I pray that if they do, that I am now adequately prepared to help them go through that and to teach them to rely fully on the Lord to strengthen them and to sustain them. I hope that because of what I went through, I can be more compassionate to others dealing with similar things. And I truly thank the Lord each day for bringing me closer to him through all this and coming out stronger and wiser because of it. I have always known I was a little different, whether through my immense love for all things grammatical, or my insatiable appetite for pulling weeds, or the completeness that I feel in a series of wall hangings that are just perfectly aligned. Well, my differentness was again proved last week when after working in nursery, I heard that another personal reflection was needed, and I texted Josh of my own volition saying, I think I heard that you're looking for more people for personal reflections last week. I would love to do one. Said no one ever, but really I would. <laughs> so this next five minutes is not, like most other reflection givers, a product of practically missing out on the last six months of my life due to the weight of a yellow sheet of paper shadowing my life. Um, but it comes from what you might call an epiphany that I have had in the last four months. For most of the 39 years of my life, I have felt the need to unburden and collect myself before coming to Jesus. You know, to not um, try to force myself to pray when I was in a period of anger or loneliness or fighting with myself over some sin that I just couldn't seem to get a hold of. Um, I knew in my head that Jesus was accessible to me since I was a believer. But what ill thoughts did he surely hold of me while I attempted to draw near and talk? Was the silence I was met with and the lack of any emotional connectedness I could have felt reflective of his scorn and tempered anger that was surely there to meet me? It wasn't until recently that I realized why I assumed God met me in my hurting or sinful states with reluctance at best, a mild disdain and a frustrated sigh of, again, are we really doing this again? Um, as much as I recognize the insurmountable difference between him and me, his holiness and his perfection, my sinfulness and failed attempts at goodness, I still assumed that God met me with reluctance because that's what I would do. When I see others' sin in our world and the depths of depravity that our culture has engaged in, I want to move away from it. At some point, I was, I believe erroneously, led to believe that God is so holy that he can't be in the presence of sin. But what I've learned in the past few months is that Christ's most natural impulse and instinct is to move toward sinners and sufferers, not away from them. From page 32 of Dane Ortland's Gentle and Lowly, and I'll be referencing and quoting from this book throughout my reflection, the same Christ who wept at the tomb of Lazarus weeps with us in our lonely despair. The same one who reached out and touched lepers puts his arm around us today when we feel misunderstood and sidelined. The Jesus who reached out and cleansed messy sinners reaches into our souls and answers our half-hearted plea for mercy with the mighty, invincible cleansing of one who cannot bear to do otherwise. And later, his actions on earth in a body reflected his heart 
the same heart now acts in the same way towards us, for we are now his body. When I read that four months ago, it was like the blinders were removed. I mean, literally the clouds broke apart and the sun shone through. And I wrote in my book, this is the relationship I have yearned for for so many years. Thought was out there but remained inaccessible to me. My view of God was too narrowly focused on his disgust with sin and inability to be in its presence instead of the Jesus who regularly reached out and touched the sinners. For most of my life, I had assumed that God nicely hides his frustration or at least his flusteredness when I come to him again for forgiveness again or with a broken heart again asking him to please, please just let me feel him in my aching loneliness again. My deepest fear, which has been a current running through my whole life, is the fear of being a burden. So not once would I have dared to imagine that Christ could experience joy and satisfaction when reaching down to help me, to soothe my aching heart, or to forgive my intentional wandering yet again. This truth about Christ's heart for sinners and sufferers is what I had missed my whole life. Through reading Gentle and Lowly, I was reminded that he can truly sympathize with me because he endured all manner of felt emotional and physical pain in his life on earth. And as we are his body, he feels presently what we feel. He shares in our suffering. John Ortland suggests that we don't take the scripture seriously when it speaks of us as Christ's body. How do we care for a wounded body part, he asks. We nurse it, bandage it. Protect it. Give it time to heal. For that body part isn't just a close friend. It is part of us. Jesus Christ is comforted when you draw from the riches of his atoning work because his own body is getting healed. This emphasis on grace and Jesus' pity for sinners and sufferers is not meant to minimize the truth of sin's evil. Immediately, my brain jumped in with Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. I know I don't fully appreciate the insidiousness of my sin. None of us does. However, we are sinners. We do sin. And I believe it's important to not only attempt to grasp how revolting my sin is to the king of the whole heavens and earth, but also how intensely my sin or my suffering evoke Jesus' deepest heart of pity and of compassion. Ortland writes, Quote, he sides with me against my sin, not against me because of my sin. I regularly think of God in terms of his glory, his greatness, his immensity, his radiance. And of course, these are true qualities of him. But Christ describes his own heart in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And the two words that he chooses are gentle and lowly. I focused on the grand, may I say, to me more aloof aspects of God. And in such a view as I had, why would he take the time to listen to my prayer that comes after weeks of virtually no praying or reading my Bible? Why would he bend his ear to me when life is too much to handle, but I haven't been seeking him regularly? Why would he set aside an assumed reproof or minimize a scolding look and a harsh word just to hear me and that I'm at the end of myself? But that's not who was waiting to hear me. Instead, it was the Jesus who also was lonely, misunderstood, yelled at, hurt deeply by those friends and companions closest to him. My suffering of things I didn't deserve and my sin, whose consequences I did deserve, <coughs> didn't repel Christ. They drew him to me even more because he longed to heal the broken parts and love me how others couldn't. In my grief, he is grieved. In my distress, he is distressed. He has become my friend. Somehow I failed to see that, quote, when we see the heart of Christ then throughout the four Gospels, we are seeing the very compassion and tenderness of who God himself most deeply is. I'm always grateful when I, what I'm learning and studying in one place reinforces what I'm studying in another area. I view it as graciousness on God's part to give me another nudge saying, see, there it is again. Focus on that again. Keep learning and let your heart accept this truth. In Bible Study Fellowship last year, we studied a good portion of the Old Testament from Kings and Chronicles to Isaiah and Jeremiah and the Minor Prophets. And in Israel's history, week after week after week, we would read about Israel's repeated sin. 
in how they had yet again de deliberately turned their backs on God and followed other gods, completely disregarded and rebelled against the God who had, spo who had chosen them specially to be his people. And what I saw was that God chased after them. Not just, I'll leave the door unlocked in case you ever realize what an idiot you're being and decide you want to come back. But he chased after them, and he yearned for them. In Jeremiah 31, 20, God calls his wayward children, Israel, his dear son and his darling child. My view of our relationship with God didn't hold room for him to talk to me like that as his darling child. But I always craved that. He says his heart yearns for Israel. His heart is to say his gut, his innermost reflex. That's where his deepest feelings are. And that part of him yearns, is restless and agitated for Israel to come back to him. Christ's deepest heart, what he longs for and what brings him joy, is not for calculating our sinfulness to determine how close to us he'll allow us to get. It's not to hold up the measuring stick before our eyes to show us yet again how lacking we are and how far we have sunk. And it's not to hold a mirror in front of us so we're forced to yet again stare at our image of imperfection and disappointment so that we can despise ourselves. And he doesn't meet me in my pain, loneliness, or despair with detached pity. He is just. He is holy. He does hate sin. But he also feels and meets my suffering with his own tears. What I have learned new this year is that his deepest heart is of compassion and mercy for sinners and for sufferers. And that has made the biggest impact on my heart and has changed and made personal my relationship with Christ. Well, like Kendra, I was recruited into this at the 11th hour, and so I don't know where the rest of this cadre of people is who is supposed to go, or were supposed to go this morning. Are they, like, giving testimonies at another church, or maybe being held in a cell for six months or something? But I, so I, yeah, the bar should be lowered, but this, uh, this is what I want to talk to you about this morning. Um, if you have been to, our, it's not a great picture, I could have, like, open the screen or something it's not I apparently put no thought into it but um, that is a view out of my office window and for those of you who've been over to uh, Richard and Connie's neck of the woods our neck of the woods Dave and Deanna's neck of the woods it's all the same it's different parts of the neck but it's all the same uh, neck of the woods um, that is our neighborhood and uh, that is the Stevens uh, house right there Dave and Deanna's house um, Janelle and I actually just passed the 10-year mark of living at the worst-named street ever. You, if any of you live on a street where you have to spell it every stinking time you're on the phone or you're, you're talking to somebody, L-Y-K-E-W-A-Y, Likeway Court. Who, who, I, don't know, I don't understand. But So uh, we have been living there for now for 10 years, uh, over 10 years, and not merely because of our marriage that coincided with that period, um, not merely because of children that came along during that period, not merely because of wonderful church that we've attended that whole time, but in part because we've been afforded uh, the opportunity to live in close community with our friends. Uh, that's kind of what I would like to chat about just briefly this morning. So growing up, I bounced around the country. Uh, I was born in upstate New York in Syracuse, moved down to south, southern New Jersey. Um, a little community down there, then to Fort Wayne, then to Dayton, Tennessee, and then to Orlando, then West Lafayette, and then back to Fort Wayne. And I don't, um, maybe some of you who are military brats or who have bounced around the country as well, I haven't really ever met another child or young adult who likes being uprooted every few years to uh, go and start over elsewhere, and uh, certainly no different with me. Over time, I kind of grew contemptuous of of that, despite the noble intentions of my parents. They were going and taking a, you know jobs and and earning money so that we could live, and that was great. Um, but I've, obviously, as a kid, you don't fully appreciate that, and so I resolved when I had a family of my own to do things just a touch differently. Um, 
Before leaving home after graduating high school, I heard many warnings uh, from people in the vein or on the topic of living with friends. Um, and I'm sure you've, you've heard uh, pieces or, or bits of advice like this. Uh, the general sentiment, I guess, is that relationships generally deteriorate uh, with friends, with family, with acquaintances, with others, uh, the more intimate and the more close-knit they become. So for the next 10 years after I graduated in 2001, I <coughs> kind of just de facto chose the opposite approach um, bef and all the way up until getting married in 2011. I, uh, between those two times, I lived with many friends, family members, even a mentor or two, uh, college roommates, buddies in apartments, families that were kind enough to have me in their homes, um, extended traveling with acquaintances and so on. Not only did those relationships not degrade, I found over that 10 year period, at least from my perspective, maybe they degraded from other people's perspective. <laughs> maybe they were really excited when I left, but um, those, uh, the, I, I found that those relationships flourished and I still count those relationships as blessings today. Uh, those 10 years resulted in, a, uh, resulted in a deepening bond with those whom I was blessed to spend time Though not without friction for periods, I look back on that dec decade with, with fondness. And when Janelle and I got married in 2011, we um, earnestly desired to live near friends. Uh, there was a vacant house across the street from which that picture was eventually taken um, that uh, uh, we had our eye on. Uh, so we moved into a, another house a few minutes away from there and then um, it wouldn't be an, uh, until another year and a half after we were married that that house actually came up for sale. Um, and with Dave and Deanna's permission, and that's kind of a weird question to ask somebody like, can we move in across the street from you? Um, we, they said, yeah. So uh, maybe not knowing what they were signing up for, but uh, they agreed. And so we, we bought the house. Uh, we moved into our current home in the spring of 2013. And it's just been... Uh, one blessing after another ever since. Um, as a side note, as I mentioned before, Richard and Connie uh, built their house down the street. Uh, Deanna's parents built their house down the street as well. And we've had people that have come to church here who live in our little neighborhood as well as, um, over the years too. But uh, I suppose the advice that I'd been given decades ago about not cohabitating with friends and being wary of that is in the same vein as like, don't work with your friends, like don't go into business with your friends, don't go to church with your friends, don't travel with your friends, and so on. Um, and I think if you're the sort of person that's like fiercely independent, such that the proximity and vulnerability with others make you grow further apart rather than together, um, then that advice makes sense. And it kind of makes sense in our culture, which is very autonomous, very independent. If, however, you and your family and your environment uh, find yourself loving your spouse and children and parents and in-laws, fellow Christians and so forth more and more as you weave your lives together, and that's what living in community with others is, then any arrangement that facilitates that, that helps that uh, intertwining of lives will probably be a good thing and to your liking. And I get that we all have different personalities. I'm not saying we don't, we don't we can't we can't honor those, and we have different tolerances for relationships. I'm, I'm not I'm not advocating for just like a you know hippie commune or anything. But uh, it's it's easy it's easy for an extroverted person like me to say, hey, like after church, spend lots of time together with other people. Like be here for an hour and a half, just you know. Um, because that's, to, if I say that to an introverted person, that's a tough ask. Um, and it's, it's less complicated for messier people to live with neater people because they're messier. They just don't care as much. Um, there, there's all sort there, and so on and so forth. There's all sort of differences between us. I'm not trying to minimize those. But we do have to recognize how wildly autonomous our attitudes are as Americans. Uh, we have the luxuries through wealth land, resources, family arrangements, all that stuff, to cordon off an enclave for ourselves and never, if we choose to, deeply associate with other humans for the rest of our lives. We can just go Unabomber style, live in the woods, never talk with anybody. Um, this is obviously not the historical norm, uh, and I don't think it's the biblical command. Um, I've, that's maybe a topic for another time, but John Donne's famous No Man is an Island line is memorable because it's, it's true. Uh, the history of humanity is shot through 
with neighbors knowing one another intimately out of necessity, not out of convenience or because they choose to. Um, if you needed food or drink, assistance, protection, counsel, entertainment, collaboration, so on, you have, for time immemorial, gone to your neighbor. Uh, today, you text someone two states away, or you order online from Walmart, or you queue up a Netflix documentary or search Google. You do everything except walk next door. And I just don't think we're meant to live that way. Uh, we ought not to be leeches on our neighbors, like we're not, not supposed to be Kramer from Seinfeld, but it's the most natural thing in the world for us to be dependent upon our neighbors um, and for them to be dependent upon us. And that doesn't mean you have to live in a suburban context like this. That's not what I'm saying. Like Josh and Jackie live uh, next door to Brian and Christy, but there's woods and a pond and you know probably a lot of barbed wire and landmines and stuff that <laughs> separate the, their two. Uh, <laughs> don't explore their property. You'll get shot. Um, so you, I mean, there, there's that way of doing it as well. It doesn't have to be like this, obviously, but it does entail whatever arrangement it is, uh, deep, uh, genuine relationships and a concerted effort um, towards those around you, around us. Um, in our current home, we do have that with the Stevens and other families in the neighborhood. Uh, I'm confident of that. And I would not, I would not trade that for anything. Uh, back in 2009, I lived in a half of a duplex, and a good friend and his wife lived in the other half. Um, and I was just struck by the number of ad hoc get-togethers, good conversations, meals, and so forth that we just fabricated out of thin air because we happened to arrive home at the same time, or happened to see each other out doing yard work, or we happened to need something that the other uh, had, um, or whatever it would be. We all have such busy lives, and they're just they're just filled to the brim uh, all the time. Often we have to plan things so far in advance, especially when with families. You know, you think about how crazy it is that you have to plan something out like months in advance just to get on each other's calendars. You know, it almost becomes absurd and laughable at times. I think living in close proximity to friends forces them into your lives in a way, and for, you know, you force yourself into theirs. They force themselves into yours just be, just by by dint of being next door or being right down the street. We have found that we make time for the Stevens and they make time for us, probably more the latter than the former, but um, whenever those things happen, it's enriching. I can't ever remember thinking, oh, I, I, I wish we wouldn't have gotten together for this evening of fulfilling delightful conversation and food with our families. Like, that never happens. Um, and it's true that choosing where you live will impact your financial picture tremendously. That's the, you know, the, big, the big caveat here, right? Um, it's a lot of money, uh, to, whether it's a house, a condo, an apartment, whatever. It's a lot of money to choose where you live and have it be strategic in this way. But instead of picking out the perfect place for you and your family based on the number of bedrooms, the bathrooms, school district, price point, or whatever, which is like what we're, we look for when we go on Zillow or whatnot, um, I'd encourage you just to maybe think of first and foremost about what sort of community you're moving into. Um, further, for every like normal detail of a home, a condo, apartment, whatever, as we just mentioned, that applies only to those living inside of it, uh, think of the features that apply to others. Like, can we entertain and host in this place? I know that was a consideration Josh and Maddie went through when they were buying their most recent house. Does it have a front porch or a patio that would be like conducive to conversations with neighbors? Like, you think of some of those old, you know, houses from 100, 150 years ago. They all have those those front porches like that are just they invite you in to have conversations, to sit down and talk with people that you know you no, people aren't like hiding out back in their in their backyards. They're out front, like on the street, waiting to be talked to. In in some sense, um, do they have does it have a playground or you know a jungle gym, a pool, other elements that would invite intrinsically or implicitly rather invite people in. Um, when we stretched our budget, uh, when we bought our current home, uh, we thought it seems, it, like just projecting out in the future, it seems like the benefits of living here will outweigh the additional 10, 20 grand or whatever it was uh, at the time, which was a big chunk of money. But looking back now, that calculation is laughable. It is, it is laughable because even if it were quantifiable, the benefits that we've derived from being there 
it would it would be a multiple of that amount of money. I mean, it just, it, it's not even a consideration. We would have recouped that in experiences uh, and benefits within the first few weeks of living there, let alone over the last 10 years. These summer days, like right now, are the richest to me. Uh, I look up from whatever's going on at the house and I see our kids and the Stevens kids roaming around together and with the other neighborhood kids, forming gangs, doing, Weird stuff, getting into trouble, do, you know, wrecking various parts of the property, which is fine. Um, they're, playing, they're arguing with us about when to come in. I mean, like, think about some of your most cherished childhood memories, arguing with your parents about, it's not, it's not dark yet, it's still twilight, I can still see my hand in front of my face, like, it's not that dark, I don't have to come in. Um, I just love that stuff. Um, they're, but they're growing up so fast. Um, and when I can't figure out how to repair something and need advice, that's pretty often. When Janelle or I need to borrow something, again, pretty often. When Stephen's cat escapes or when, the, when what, whatever's going on, really any excuse to see our friends uh, is a good one. And, of course, these things can happen in any neighborhood, or, uh, and our experience isn't prescriptive. That's not what I'm trying to say this morning. Still, it has been so rich and rewarding that I hope for those of you who are a bit younger, uh, you consider this when plotting out your next couple of decades and where you'll live and where you'll go and what you'll do. Uh, it might seem odd to live by your parents or your friends or your in-laws, um, but I promise, promise, promise you will not, not regret it. And for those of you who are a bit older, perhaps keep it in the back of your mind when you're plotting out your latter you know, moves in life when you're plotting out retirement or being an empty nester or what, whatever it is, um, perhaps there's a, a way to share that with, with people who are at that same stage or, or again, living by your kids and uh, uh, grandkids and so forth like that. Um, so anyway, I don't have any profound life lesson this morning, uh, nothing, nothing, again, too prescriptive. Just wanted to share anecdotally what, has, what it has been like for, at least on, on our side, maybe Dave will get up in six months and be like, here are all the reasons not to live next to your friends or whatever. But, um, but I would just encourage you to find believers you love uh, and li live near some of them. Uh, grow old together, cherish the time, weave your lives together, even when it's challenging. Uh, it is worth it. It is rich. It is wonderful. Uh, God has blessed us so greatly through it. So thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Claire and Kendra and Nate. Next week, we will um, return to the normal routine. We'll have a sermon and that sort of thing. Uh, we'll turn to Old Testament basics. In the meantime, the next couple weeks or so, I'll be recruiting folks for the next Body Life Sunday, which will be in December. Give you plenty of time to fret about it and prepare for it, that sort of thing. Um, so for those of you who may kind of wonder what this is all about, we're kind of trying to honor the spirit of um, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, a lot of emphasis there on the church being in every member ministry and people exhorting each other, admonishing each other, encouraging each other, sharing with each other, holding each other accountable, even teaching each other. And, and uh, so we provide these opportunities about twice a year to kind of do formally what takes place informally, organically, um, after the service, before the service, and through the week as people interact with each other. Um, so at this time, I'll have you stand, and I will dismiss us with this uh, short benediction. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Upon those words, you are dismissed. Go in Christ's name, enjoy each other, and serve each other in love. <laughs>